Welcome everybody. This is the Patterns for Large Scale View Applications uh, talk. And I'm excited to be here with you guys. I, um, I've got a very interesting setup going on here. So if at any point, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going from a Zoom meeting on my laptop here to a uh, connected with Zoom on a, another laptop here, which is actually being shared to the screen. So if at any point I get kicked out of the meeting, uh, <laughs> you have to bear with me as we get back into the meeting, but uh, yeah, it's all cool. Um, all right, so uh, just real quickly, did want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Daniel Kelly. I am the lead instructor over at uh, View School. I asked this yesterday, but I definitely see a few more faces in the audience today. So. Uh, who who in here is aware of View School or has any knowledge of View School at all? Show hands. Okay, cool. Um, so I got a little more work to do. Uh, <laughs> um, to be honest, uh, I, I've been at View School for a couple of years, and before I joined uh, before I joined the View School team, I was a full stack developer, and I learned a decent amount of View from View School. So there's a lot of good stuff um, there. Um, while I was doing full stack dev, I also did uh, Laravel, PHP on the back end, and then uh, Vue.js, of course, on the front end. Um, so that's just a little bit about me. Uh, I am a uh, father of three children, and they keep me busy a lot of the day, especially now that I'm 100% work from home. Uh, sometimes in the, I'm in the middle of a meeting, and uh, yeah, you get that little knock on the door, somebody yelling, my, my office is right next to my youngest child's, um, bedroom, which in hindsight wasn't the best idea. Uh, but I'm sure probably a lot of you in today's remote world have experienced the same. All right. So yeah, let's talk a little bit today about um, some patterns for large scale uh, Vue.js applications. So first, I want to answer this, this question. Uh, what is the best way to structure a Vue.js application so that it continues to uh, be maintainable the more it grows. This is the problem a lot of us run into, right? Because certainly you've worked on a project where you've uh, gotten your issue through JIRA or whatever it is, and is this thing super loud to you guys? Um, it's good? Okay. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, but you, you get ready to go do your task, and this is what you feel like, right? You don't, don't even know where to start. You don't know which file to go to. You don't know, you know uh, where in the code base to, to even start working. And maybe this is because you're the brand new developer on the team, you're just being introduced to this new project, or maybe it's a project you've actually been working on for a while. And I'm really sad to say that I've felt like this many times on projects that um, I even started from, from the ground up. So. There will be times during this talk where I share with, when, that I'll share with you things that I learned from my mistakes, so you don't repeat those same things. All right, so number one to me is that predictability is really a good place to start when it comes to large-scale applications. Yes, functionality is, is great, but making a code base predictable is sometimes just as important. Okay, what I mean by that is the ability to hop into a project and then see exactly what tools are available to you, right? What functions do I have available, available to me at this time? What functions can I call? What file do I need to go to to um, accomplish X, Y, Z, right? That's what I'm talking about when I say predictability. And the thing that can help this most it's not exciting, it's not flashy, but it's true, is standards, right? Uh, my youngest child that's in the bedroom right next to my office has a full-size bed. I can go to the closet, I can grab some full-size sheets, stick them on his bed, and I know they'll fit every single time, right? Why? Because there are standards in place. All right, so, that begs the question, what are the standards that we have available in the Vue.js community? Well, one of the first one that comes to mind for me is the Vue.js style guide. That's found at vue.js.org slash style guide, okay? And this is just a, 
a document to help provide some different stylistic standards that um, can be used across the, the Vue community. Let's take a look at some examples. We certainly won't go through all these different style guide things because you can go and read them for yourself, but let me just give you a taste of what, what is in there. Okay, so there are some component standards listed. Uh, first of all, it mentions that single file components should all be Pascal case, right? So none of this app dash popup dot view stuff, okay? It also mentions that we should prefix any base components with app or base. Who in here, uh, just real quickly, I'm, I'm gonna be a little interactive. I've got 55 minutes here, which is a super generous amount of time for a talk. So I wanna get you guys input just a little bit. Um, who in here could define a, a base component? What do you think of when you think of a base component? Anybody? Used in multiple places. Exactly. Yeah, it's a component like a button, right? It's something that you're gonna reuse, and it's really a generic thing. It's something that you'd find in like a UI library, right? Okay, so prefix those with app or base. And I even personally like to stick with app because it puts it all at the top. It starts with an A, right? All right, also go for multi-worded component names. This is not just stylistic, this is actually preventing conflicts between browser native tags, okay? Uh, you got divs, you got spans, blah, blah, blah. All that by definition is always one word. If you do multi-worded component names, this is gonna prevent any collisions, okay? It also says to prefix single instance components with the word the. This sounds kind of WordPressy to me, but it works, all right? Um, once again, who can tell me what, what a single instance component might be? Anybody? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, it's just something that like typically appears only once on a page, right? It's the header, it's the footer, it's the sidebar, it's um, something that's not really a reusable thing like the, the app button, okay? So prefix those with the. Uh, also prefix tightly coupled child components with the name of the, the parent component. So this is a very real life example. This is something I did in a application at my previous job. We had a, a job uh, form, right? It was a form to, to create a new job in our hiring platform. Um, <clears throat> and so you had a job form and then you had a field on that form uh, that was a interactive like map in order to pick the locations where this job was to be available, okay? Um, so you have job form dot view, and then that field on that particular form is prefixed with job form. And then you have the, the rest of it there. This just makes sure that developers who are coming to this project know that this component is only meant to be used within the context of the parent. Okay, it's a simple way to do it. Um, and then also to suggest to begin with the most general and end with the most specific. So here we have a search widget. Um, and then you have search widget input and then search widgets uh, result list view. And this is directly from those docs. So these aren't like, just like mind numbing concepts. This is easy stuff, right? But this, if you do these things, that means someone who is uh, just being onboarded to the team or just being onboarded to the project, they can immediately dive into your project and start knowing things just based on the names of your components. Okay, so predictability. Now it's worth noting here that this style guide uh, does have this status notice at this time. It really hasn't been updated since view three and since the new docs were released earlier this year, end of last year. Um, so it doesn't have some good rules for like new things like composables and things like that, but there's still some really good, um, good information in there. All right, so another way to be predictable in your code base is to use the officially recommended tooling. Some of you might be thinking, okay, Daniel, this kind of goes without saying, but who in here is guilty of writing their own global state, global store solution? Show of hands? <laughs> yeah, I've done it, okay. Uh, I, I've used, in V2, there was this thing called view.observable, right? And I thought Vuex was crappy in terms of like, yeah, I didn't like doing commits and mutations. That was the main thing, right? And so I said, okay, I'm gonna do my own store. I'm gonna use view.observable. And um, not only did I run into some issues with like um, uh, things not being cached properly, 
And uh, so some optimizations things that really bit me in the butt. But the main thing was, is when new developers came on this project that I started, they didn't know what in the world I was doing, right? If I'd use Vue X, you can just pick it up and start running, okay? So use the officially recommended tooling. For Vue 3, that's Vite for your build tool. That's Pina for your global state management solution. Of course, a lot of people are still familiar with Vue X, so I think that would be a very viable option as well. But use the tool that other developers are familiar with. And if there is a use case for your particular app that's a little bit more custom, right? A lot of these tools come with plugin systems, ways to extend them. So you don't have to rewrite the whole thing just to make things a little easier for your app because you have a little custom scenario. You could write a Pina plugin. You could write a uh, plugin for V, whatever, okay? Another good place for predictability is UI frameworks. Some of the most popular ones are Vuetify. Who in here uses Vuetify in their apps? Show of hands. Okay, yeah. Um, who uses Bootstrap View? Not a single person. Okay. Who uses uh, Prime View? Anybody? Okay, we got some folks back there. Cool. Uh, sh shout it out. If I haven't mentioned your UI framework, what do you, what do you use? Anybody? Custom, okay, custom UI framework. Okay, cool. Um, so <clears throat> the idea here is that when you use some of the more popular ones, <laughs> Beautify is huge, right? Um, when you're onboarding new people to your code base, they're already gonna be familiar with these frameworks in, you know, 50-50 chance, okay? So predictability is going to be increased um, because you're using something that other people are familiar with. Now, I know there's a case for using custom stuff, okay? But at the end of the day, you have to weigh the pros and cons, right? Um, so I just encourage you to, to really think about that before building your own thing. Like, what is the end result that you're actually trying to get to, right? If it's an internal dashboard for your, uh, <laughs> you know, for your company's internal team somewhere, is it really that important that it looks like you want it to look? Or can it just be an off-the-shelf solution like Beautiful? Okay. All right, lastly, uh, Nux3 and Nux2 previous to that is a great source of predictability for working with Vue.js. I know a lot of people think about, um, they think about Nux as like being this server render tool where you can you know, render your things on the server side, right? But there's a really good use case um, for actually using Nux even for SPAs just because of all the different conventions that it provides. And I'm actually gonna be talking about Nux3 a decent amount throughout uh, the rest of this, this talk because it does provide so many useful conventions that not only are just good for conventions, good for predictability, but because of those conventions, they're able to build functionality on top. So things like automated, automatic imports based on the name of a folder, like auto importing your composables, auto importing your components, and so on, okay? <clears throat> um, by the way, this is just a screenshot for the documentation, and um, yeah, it mentions one of the benefits here is, is conventions. All right, so that is number one, make your code base predictable, and I think that is the number one, this is an order, at least for that first one, that is the number one way you're going to build a scalable app, is by being predictable. Okay, but number two, is to take full advantage of your IDE, all right? If you are using Vue 3, and if you're using VS Code, the extension of choice now is Volar, okay? If you're in Vue 2, and you've had the VTR extension installed for who knows how long, and you're moving to Vue 3, go ahead and remove VTR, okay? And then install Volar. This is going to give you a better support for uh, v3. It gives you, of course, the syntax highlighting for your single file components, but there's some other really cool things that it does as, as well, okay? Uh, also, use linting. Um, in this day and age, maybe that's something I shouldn't have to say, um, but I've worked on plenty of projects, still do some freelance stuff on projects that other people are making where there's no linting. And honestly, it's just, it's just a pain, right? 
Um, who in here is, I don't want to harp on this too much, who in here is familiar with linting? Show of hands, okay, awesome. Okay, so I don't have to go into this too much. Um, I just wanted to quickly though, let's take a look at some of the uh, rules available for ESLint for, um, for view. So you have thing in, things in here like uh, view multi-word component names. So that's pretty cool. This is, uh, if, you, if you have your linting set up properly, you actually get some of this, did it go away? Okay, you actually get some of this style guide stuff automatically in your IDE, which is great. So maybe you've been following the style guide and you didn't even realize it, okay? So, so linting not only helps with errors, but it helps with some of these stylistic things as well. All right. <clears throat> okay, and it's easy enough to add linting to your V3 projects. All right, also formatting. Make sure you've got your IDE set up to auto format things for you. Um, in VS Code, you can set it up, I think, um, uh, format on save, I think is the name of the setting, um, to where you just, whatever formatter of your choice, prettier, or the one that's built into Volar, or uh, one that comes with ESLint, you can just automatically have your files um, formatted when you save. And this is just a super handy time saver, okay? Super easier, easy once again to set up with a new V3 project. Uh, we have a course at View School dedicated to, if you're using VS Code, kind of pointing out some of these tips and tricks to making sure you're using your IDE to its fullest extent. And um, this one's actually been quite popular, and I really highly suggest if you use VS Code uh, along with Vue.js, you give this a give this a try, okay? Because it's going to give you some nice tips and tricks to make sure you're optimizing your workflow in your IDE, okay? All right. Um, another way to take full advantage of your IDE is by using TypeScript. Yeah, I said it. Okay. Um, who in here is using TypeScript a little bit? Who in here is like full on TypeScript? Okay, who in here is like, nah, not for me? Okay, fair. I was in the nah, not for me camp for a very long time. Um, but there's some really cool things that, that TypeScript provides even more than just like error prevention. Like the error prevention's cool, um, but to me, some of the, the ways that it interacts with your IDE, like getting the autocomplete options, um, is, is, is huge. Like I, I've had developers I've worked with in the past, like they would be a whole new level of productivity if they had that simple and, and focused autocomplete within their IDE, okay? And they wouldn't be searching all over the place for <laughs> trying to get all these things because they could, uh, you know, more easily have that autocomplete work for them. Um, let me just real quickly, um, I'm gonna show you guys a little bit how that works with props and events and view, because it's really, really cool. Okay, so is that, do I need to zoom in some? I'm good, okay. Um, so this is a simple component. It just has a single count prop defined on it. And it is of the type number, okay? Notice not, I'm not even writing TypeScript at this point, okay, I'm just writing regular JavaScript view. Now let's go over to actually use that component. So I'm importing my component from that file. Don't worry about the naming, that's just to help me. Okay, and so then I go to actually use that component, right? Well, as soon as I hit colon here, notice that, yeah, I've got some, some other things that are just basic for all view components, but I also have count right there in my list. Okay, that wouldn't be available without TypeScript. Uh, so I do count now, and then I pass in, let's see, what did count had to be a number, right? So let's, let's say I pass in a string of hello. Okay, save my file, which by the way, you saw the auto reformatting there. Okay, and I hover over this, and it says type string is not assignable to type number. So now I know without ever having to look at my component that, oh, I should provide a number here instead of a string. And this works not just when I'm like directly typing inside of my template, like this works 
if this was a variable defined in the script section, like if this was a variable defined in another file, right? You can see how that scales in terms of being able to catch yourself and not having to have the whole code base in your head at one time when your IDE is looking out for you, okay? The same thing works with events. So here I have a component where I've defined a prop count um, and I've defined an event to emit called increment, okay? So then when I go to use this component, so once again, we've got my component, okay? And then I wanna listen to it increment. Notice it's the first thing on my list here. So once again, I know what events this component is going to emit because I'm using TypeScript. So I can just hit enter and then if I type in event here, dollar sign event, which is what is emitted from the component, okay? And then I hover over event. Uh, is that not right? Let's, uh, let's do it this way. Let's say handle um, increment. Okay. Uh, so I do handle increment and we'll define that up here as a uh, arrow function. We'll look at the event there. Okay, so I think, what am I doing wrong here? Um, handle event void, and this is, let me go back to this. So I'm defining emits, oh, I haven't, uh, I haven't actually typed this yet. So if I were to define emits here uh, using TypeScript instead, um, let's do to define emits, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so this is the, yep running out of time, meeting will end in 10 minutes. <laughs> so uh, we'll get back on shortly. Um, so when I'm defining my mitts, now I can define the type of the payload, okay? And so we can say that the payload here is going to be a number, all right? And my event is increment, okay? And um, so then back over in when I'm using it here, I should be able to say dollar sign event, Let's see, I think that's right. Event does not exist on type increment. I am incrementing here. Okay, I thought I should be able to say dollar sign event and this would tell me that this is a number, um, but perhaps I'm missing something. Anyways, you get the idea. Um, you're able to uh, put your types on these, um, on these events and these props coming in. All right. Yeah, thank you, Zoom, okay. Um, all right, so TypeScript, able to prevent errors as you develop, makes your refactors less risky and stressful, and gives your autocomplete superpowers. Cool. All right, by the way, Nux3 comes with support for TypeScript out of the box. Um, and this is actually a really good way to get introduced to TypeScript, because you can start coding along in JavaScript all you want, but then as you find one little use case that could benefit from TypeScript, maybe it's defining an interface for XYZ resource, post, user, blah, blah, blah. You can kind of start sprinkling some of these things in and get used to it, okay? Uh, Nux even generates some types for us on the fly. This is really super cool. So uh, in Nux3, you can make uh, API routes that are based on files and while you're running your development server, it will automatically generate types for those routes. And so anytime you call $fetch in order to make an Ajax request to one of those routes, you actually get an autocomplete list of the routes. So you can just arrow down and choose which one you wanna call. All right, so take full advantage of your IDE. Let's take a look now at a good file structure for a predictable app. And as you might expect, I'm coming back to Nuxt once again. Because once again, this is a community-wide convention. Like this is the best thing we have in view. And it's really, really pretty awesome, okay? So not only do we get these conventions, but we have components that are auto-imported. We have composables that are auto-imported. We have plugins that are automatically registered just on the existence of the file. Uh, and we have pages that are turned into routes. Okay, so no more fussing with setting up view router manually and, and manually defining all those routes. Just based on the existence of the file, um, your, your routes are auto-generated for you. 
All right, so now let's take a look at route naming convention. I think it's important for you to come up with some kind of strategy for naming your routes. I come from a Laravel background, and so this is a screenshot from the Laravel documentation, okay? Um, so this is using a photos resource as an example. So you have slash photos, you make a git request to slash photos, and um, this is basically for listing all of your photos, right? So think of a typical CRUD application. You're, you're doing four things, right? Create, read, update, delete. Um, and these routes handle all those things. Um, <clears throat> so your, your index route, your slash whatever the resource is, is always going to be for listing all the things. Um, so think of like a blogs in a blog, uh, or posts in a blog, right? You have a list of all those posts. That's what this slash whatever the resource name will be, okay? And then you have a get request to slash photos slash create, right? This is going to be for creating a new photo, blog post, whatever. You have a post request to slash photos slash resource. This is going to be for uh, the actual request made to, to actually create the thing, okay? So get slash photos slash create. This is going to be the, like the form, the view for creating that new thing. And the post request is going to be the actual creation. All right, uh, getting, you have slash whatever the resource is, slash an ID, all right? And uh, for editing, you have slash the resource, slash the ID, slash edit. Okay, so uh, the others put in patch, yeah, these are the actual calls to, we would think of it as a, as view developers, probably as like the API request, right? Um, but yeah, the, the main ones here are in order to view these certain pages, in order to do certain things, okay? So this is really the naming convention that I like to follow because it's something that other developers I work with are already familiar with, okay? How would this look in nuts? would probably look something like this, okay? Inside of your pages directory, you could have a photos directory, so that automatically creates your slash photos because I have an index.view in here. Now, I modified this just slightly. My edit, just so I could get it on the same level of the file structure, I've changed to edit-id, so you don't have slash id, you know, slash edit anymore, so it's slightly different, but it helps uh, read the file structure just a little bit. And then you have create, and then you have uh, ID here, all right? So it's pretty easy to carry a concept over from one framework into another framework. So if other developers on your team are familiar with uh, a certain routing convention, you can recreate that in your view apps and make things more predictable. Now, I also like to include a partials directory inside my routes. And this kind of comes from Laravel as well. Um, just a wild guess, who in here who in here knows what I, I use this partials directory for? Anybody? Just a wild guess. This is, this is me, and this is my convention. If you get it wrong, it's okay. <laughs> okay, so, so the way I like to use partials um, is these are components that are only used within these pages, okay? So I, I have a components directory, but I like to reserve that more for a little bit more reusable components, right? So if I have a component that literally only shows up for this particular resource, throw it in a partial directory, um, and then everyone knows, okay, if I mess with this component, I only have to check page X. I don't have to go make sure I didn't mess up something on page Y, Z, A, B, okay? Um, <clears throat> and so this partials directory, um, if I'm working in view, actually gives me a dedicated route to view that partial within isolation, which is pretty cool. I can even, I can work with this component without having to worry about the other stuff on my page, okay? Sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it's not. It's not, it depends on what you're doing with it, right? But then you could even do something like this in Knox, where at development time, you have that dedicated route for your partial so you can kind of do things in isolation, but then at build time, you can remove that route so it's not available for your production app because it doesn't make sense, right? All right, so you can certainly copy this convention, but the point is have one. Have a convention for your routes. It's going to make things easier in the end. All right, uh, tip number five here is to wrap 
your third-party code. Wrap your third-party code. Um, Josh Deltner, who created the, uh, the Mastering Nux course, if that is something uh, that is um, part of U School, so we, uh, we help produce the Mastering Nux course as well, and he did the Mastering Nux version too, okay? Really smart dude, has a, um, I think it's a, like a trucking uh, website that sells, um, sells parts for automobiles for, for trucks and things, and it's all built on Nuxt, okay? He wrote this awesome article called Nuxt Enterprise Patterns Provider Abstractions, and this is what I mean when I say wrap third-party code. The idea, well, first of all, why? Why wrap third-party code? First, it decreases the chance of third-party lock-in, and it also increases the surface area for app-specific optimization. So what is it? Okay, what is this actually wrapping the, the code? Um, so here's just a quick and dirty example. Let's pretend I'm using Axios as my way to make AJAX requests, okay? If I were to wrap Axios, a third-party library, it might look something like this. I could create a class called HTTP, and I could define a get function on that class, and inside of that get function or get method, I could actually use Axios to make the request and then return, you know, how I, I return the data however I wanted my, um, my HTTP class to work. Okay? So the cool thing about this now is if I ever wanted to switch my dependency, now once again, this is kind of a dumbed down example, all right, but Let's say I wanted to switch from Axios to Fetch, okay? I'm gonna tell you why it's not important here. And my meeting is ending. All right, take a quick stretch break, guys. Give me like two minutes, and I'm gonna get back in here. All right, cool. All right, so we are back in action here. Thank you guys for uh, bearing with me on that. Um, my bet is this is the first time you've seen a meeting presented over Zoom while you're in the same room as the person presenting them <laughs> the presentation. All right, uh, so <clears throat> back to wrapping our third-party code here. So if we wanted to change out Axios for fetch, uh, now at this point, we simply replace uh, the dependency in the wrapper code. So every time I'm make, making an AJAX request now throughout my entire application, I don't have to update anything, right? The, my, the rest of my app is completely unaware that the, that the dependency has changed. And so this makes for switching out these third-party things that sometimes may be more stable and more reliable, but sometimes maybe not so much. And in such cases, it's really worth considering wrapping some of these dependencies. Now, is it a little extra work up front? Sometimes. But 
Um, if it's something that's not quite as reliable, it's certainly something worth considering uh, doing. Um, plus, by the way, you can massage the data that comes out of this, right? So the Axios uh, data that comes back and the return from Axios is a little different than the way Fetch returns things, right? But because I've wrapped these up in this, this wrapped code, this, this HTTP class, I can kind of massage the response how I want it before I send it out uh, to the rest of my app, okay? All right. Um, oh, I'm going backwards, that makes sense. Um, the, other, the other thing about this though is uh, you can really expose and see more clearly some ways to extend some of this third party stuff in ways you wouldn't see if you were using it directly in your code. Uh, here's an example of what I mean by that. So in this HTTP class, uh, I could just make my HTTP uh, class automatically handle errors for me whenever I make a request. Now it's not very elegant here, I'm just throwing up an alert on the screen, you know, but maybe your application has some kind of uh, uh, UI for alerts, and then every time a request fails, you could automatically show some kind of alert, some kind of message to your user. And your class could even, you know, if, if for some reason that alert is not uh, really relevant to the user in some way, like you could, you could add a new method on this class, like a quiet method or something like that, and say, okay, for, for this particular instance, I want to handle the, the error myself. But, but for most cases, yeah, just, just let this handle it for me, okay? And I don't have to think about it until it becomes a real issue down the line in my app. All right, this is just one more example. Uh, instead of doing alerts, you could throw in some kind of caching layer with your API request. Make sure you aren't making too many requests too often. All right, so not only can you do this with, with just plain JavaScript, you can do this with your components as well, okay? This is a, uh, an app icon component, and basically the idea here is I could pass in, uh, or I could use a single app icon, but then support multiple icon libraries, okay? So there's a lot of reasons to support um, or a lot of reasons to, to wrap your third-party code, uh, whether it be easily changing out dependencies or making a uh, dependency more flexible and the, or, or even providing a coherent interface for multiple dependencies that do the same thing. Okay. All right. So tip number six here is to interact with your backends via an SDK. Okay. By show of hands, who in here would prefer, prefer writing line one over writing line two here? Anybody? You would? Okay, that's fair. And depending on the size of the application, uh, this is certainly not an issue. And maybe you extract the actual base URL to an environment variable somewhere, right? And that's even more maintainable. Uh, however, a lot of times, uh, just the brevity of line two not to mention the ability to uh, do some type checking stuff with line two and the ability to have some autocomplete options available there for line two, so that could be post.find. Now, I'm a Laravel guy, so some of this, uh, <laughs> the, the API would be similar to Laravel for me is the way I like to do it, uh, but you could have post.find, you could have post. Um, you know, get multiple ones, post.fetch, whatever. Um, and some of that would be autocompletable for you in your IDE. Now, you don't have to build these things yourself. Um, there are services like Firebase, which is a backend as a service that provides an SDK for interacting with uh, Firestore, is what it's called. It's their, their data layer, okay? So you don't have to manually make the AJAX request uh, in order to, to get your data or post your data. You can import their SDK and get these, um, get these functions and these objects that have all these different methods on them, right? Okay. By the way, we use Firebase in our Vue.js 3 masterclass. Um, and this was actually my, my first experience with Firebase and I really quite enjoyed the simplicity that it has to offer. Okay, Supabase is another good example of one of these backends as a service that provide an SDK, a JavaScript SDK, out of the box for interacting with your data. Has anybody in here used Firebase, or excuse me, Supabase? Anybody used Supabase yet? So Supabase is, um, 
It's a lot like Firebase, but the data layer is built on Postgres, which is really cool, and it's open source. Um, you could actually spin up your own Firebase, uh, I can't say the words, Superbase instance and host it yourself. Um, so it could be completely free in terms of the actual software for you to use, okay? And also just one more plug here, Superbase is what we're using in the Mastering Nux 3 course. Uh, Michael Thiessen is teaching that. He's actually, uh, I've learned quite a bit from Michael Thiessen over the years. He's an excellent teacher. All right, uh, one more little pitch here. If you are familiar with Laravel, uh, there's this really cool Laravel package called Laravel Query Builder that essentially allows you to write your controllers in a way that you can use a lot of the model stuff on the front end. Um, and it's, it's a really nice, um, really nice approach. All right, so tip number seven, testing. And to be honest, I'm not the one to be talking about this because I'm really not that great at it. But the times that I have done it, um, I have not regretted it, right? Um, your future self will thank you when you do your testing. Yeah, it's not that fun up front, but when you are introducing regressions in the future, it feels really nice, right? Um, it helps you to provide, uh, it helps to provide confidence when you're doing your, your refactors, and it helps actually to document expectations and clarify functionality. So someone who is new to your code base can come and look at your test, or even someone that's not new to the code base, but they just want to start interacting with a new function. They can come to the test and they can see, okay, this is actually what is expected, right? I mean, docs are great. But when I'm looking at the test, I can see all these different use cases for a particular function or a particular object or, or whatever, okay? All right, so some tips for good testing. Start early. Once you have gone on for a while without doing those tests and have introduced more and more dependencies, it's harder to really start doing the testing. So start testing as early as you can in your projects. Use TDD or don't. This is not, I know a lot of people come to testing with this idea that it's either TDD or nothing, but that's not true. Some people get a lot of benefit from TDD. Other people, it's a hurdle to overcome and, and a lot of people fail and then they stop at TDD and then they don't go on to testing ever, right? You still get the benefits, some of the benefits of testing without doing test-driven development, okay? So, use testing even if you aren't all in to TDD. Also, focus on public interfaces when testing. Components, this is very specific to Vue, okay? Well, any component library, but in terms of components, don't focus on testing the internals. Focus on testing the interface, like what's actually expected um, and, you know, as the end user for this little piece of the page to do, okay? And when you do that, uh, you haven't tied yourself to that internal implementation and have to update your tests whenever just that little implementation changes. Because really that's not what's that's not what's important, right? It's the, the end result that's important. Just a uh, quick mention of some tooling you have available. Let's see, what time is it? 1043. Quick mention of some of the tooling you have available for testing. Uh, in view three, the recommendations now, this is from the official view docs. Uh, the recommendation is Vitus for components or composables, and then Cypress component testing um, for more end-to-end -end tests, okay? And, um, and you can use the testing library uh, at testing library uh, slash Cypress in order to get this stuff going with you. All right, so these are the seven tips I have for you guys for building your large-scale Vue.js applications. Um, I hope that you have been able to get something out of this talk and been able to um, up your, uh, your level of um, most of all your confidence for building a larger application. Like a lot of this isn't magic stuff. If, if you came in here hoping to hear some magic stuff, I'm sorry if I've disappointed you. <laughs> um, but large scale applications are really about taking small steps in order to build something really large, okay? Um, if you are interested in learning more about topics like TypeScript that we've talked about in this talk, uh, we've got a really great course at Vue School on TypeScript. Um, if you're interested in learning more about Pina, 
which is the newly recommended global state management solution for Vue. We've got a course for that as well. And we've got a course for VTest if you really want to start implementing tests in really the most efficient way in Vue 3. It's really fast. Um, we've got a new course that it's, I know it says coming soon on this slide, but it was actually just released last week. Anthony Fu is recording that and has produced that for us. And he is the creator of VTest. So um, I think it's a really excellent opportunity to get into testing if it's something that's new to you. All right. Uh, we also offer uh, some different corporate training opportunities. So if you are building a large scale app and you need a little bit of help, we have some solutions that maybe we can help you out with here at Vue School, including a database for hiring Vue developers. Um, also, we have uh, biweekly support sessions where you can get online with a real Vue developer. At the time, it's me. <laughs> uh, but we hope to do expand that perhaps even in the future. Um, and we have live workshops to, if you want to move your, you know, move your team from using Vuex to something like Pina, we've got a workshop for that. If you want to do something like, uh, you know, move your team from using more of the options API to the composition API, we have a workshop for that as well. And it's all hands-on. You get to ask questions. You get to uh, play with code and, and like hands-on exercises, and you get to do it with a team of people. So it's really pretty cool experience. Okay, you can learn more about that at vueschool.io slash training. And then just one last shout out here. Uh, because we do have a Nux Nation conference next week, I know you've heard a lot about Nux in this talk, but I really think a lot of the future of Vue um, can be found in Nux because it happens both on the server side and the client side. It opens up so many more possibilities, okay? So check out that um, it's a completely free conference, 16th and 17th next week. Um, you can visit that nuxnation.com in order, in order to find out more details. All right. Uh, thank you guys very much for being here, and thank you for your, uh, your time and your patience with the Zoom meeting here. Um, I do have some free, like, View School swag up here. If anybody's wants some stickers, we've got a little backpack that has like a Pini logo and Beat logo hanging out of it, I think. It's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, feel free to grab any of that. And definitely um, feel free to grab me. And if you have any questions after this about, about anything, view or, or whatever, hit me up. We'll talk. Thanks, guys.